everyone, my name is Shoko. Um, I think I left the wrong bio for the event description. So uh, I used to be an institutional investor uh, specializing in healthcare. And I also did a bit of M&A um, based in Italy and selling a lot of dying and dying companies to the lots of Asian investors. And then we decided to start our renewable uh, startup out of Italy, but most mar main market was Japan. So we did this for a couple of years and then also went through the exit and then now moved to Singapore to full time investing. So yeah, that's my question. <coughs> I am Raphael, um, a venture investor um, in startups. Uh, we aim for Series A, but we normally end up doing seed stage. And um, how we're different, I guess, is that we're not VCs, we're entrepreneurs, we've had exits and then put the money into other people's companies rather than our own. And we have experienced some of the challenges that are involved in growing a uh, scalable business and overcoming um, some of the, the hurdles as you expand through uh, a region, be it Southeast Asia or Europe. Uh, so we try and add uh, some value to the board and to the entrepreneurs beyond money alone, which everybody says they do, but uh, it's always the case. <laughs> um, amusing, what do you say? A funny thing that has happened. Um, the only thing I could think of really was uh, one of the first events I did uh, when I started with Ventures One. I was asked to chair a, a round table discussion at an InsureTech event and one, uh, one guy really monopolised the conversation um, saying how terrible VCs were um, and <laughs> it kind of went on for about five minutes and um, then I got to speak and he said, sorry Raphael, I was like, yeah Raphael, I've been just wondering, oh, I've got a meeting with you next Tuesday. <laughs> 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 so, it <laughs> didn't work out in the end, but there we go. <laughs> you can still it, right? No, no, I, I like it. We still get it, so uh, it's fine. <laughs> That's way funnier than anything I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I'm Brandon Aver, nice to meet everybody. Um, let's see, I'm originally from Ohio, which is in America, uh, and it's great in the middle of nowhere. Um, let's see, moved here a couple of years ago to Singapore, uh, lived in Sydney before that, uh, lived in uh, Ireland before that, and then lived in Chicago before that. Um, so I work with fast growing tech businesses and help them build scalable sales and marketing engines. So I either work with large businesses to build out a piece of their function that they haven't built out yet, like demand generation, sales development, inside sales, enterprise sales. Um, or unscrew up a lot of the things that they've screwed up over <laughs> multiple years, which is un-effing things up is a large part of what I do uh, for large businesses. And then for small businesses and startups, anywhere from building everything out from scratch, so wiring up their tools and systems they need from a sales and marketing perspective, to setting up and, and defining their sales process and marketing process, to building out measurement tools, hiring teams, uh, training them up, and then and then off to somebody else to manage it, and I uh, move on to the next one. So I do a lot of consulting and coaching. Um, gosh, something, something funny. Oh, I'm not that funny. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't think of anything on the spot, but I'm sure in the middle of a comment I'll make that I'll come back to it, and that'll be just as funny as the thing I'm gonna say. <laughs> okay. Before we continue with other questions, can I ask? Or from the audience and also the panelists, if you can raise your hands if you are uh, an entrepreneur, you have your own startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I don't see some of the presenters raising their hands too high, <laughs> being on the shy side. And who is in the room are uh, representing investors? Don't be afraid, don't be shy. Really? <laughs> okay. It's interesting, some of this is news to me, but, um, uh, and who is working as a mentor or advisor to start up, uh, thinking about probably leaving their corporate job and joining one of the startups? Only one person in the room, really, that's impressive. And it's also supposed to raise hands because you work as mentor for startups, right? That's true. Yeah? yeah that's true. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. Okay, I see, thank you. So, um, just talking about overall the purpose of this event, right? It's supposed to be a training for startups 
how they present their product, is it clear what they're trying to do? And of course, we will follow the same the same timeline as normally is given to startups when they teach at different uh, conferences, which means five minutes to present whatever they are doing, irrespective of the complexity. I'm waiting to one of the startups here in the energy sector because it's a very complicated field to present within five minutes. And then uh, the second part is probably 10, 10 minutes for Q&A session. So coming back to our panelists, can you tell me from your experience what uh, you see as the most common either mistake or pattern or something when uh, the projects are presenting their product to you? If you would do it within five minutes, because normally you spend much more time talking to them and discovering what's the business idea behind, what's the business model, what's their go-to-market strategy and so on and so forth. What's the common kind of mistake or something which you have to do when they reach their project to you? Yeah, you just you do it in the free form. Yeah. Uh, so one of the mistakes that I see. Can you please hold your mic closer? Sorry. Is, yeah, it yeah. is it on? I think so. Can everyone hear yeah. me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's better. It's so one of the things that I see happens quite often is as someone's explaining their business, they don't de-risk the conversation by explaining their background and the close match that their background has to the expertise that they're executing against when they're going about their business. So typically, people will say their background or their team experience at the end of a pitch versus at the very beginning. And I think that it makes the investor and the person on the other end of the conversation feel a lot more comfortable that you are about to tell me something that you know a shed load about. It also puts uh, the investor or the person on the other end of the conversation um, in a place where you're talking eye to eye because they may hold the cards or the cash for from an investment perspective, but you know what the hell you're talking about. And explaining that very quickly within your team's background is really helpful. So it's a very eye-to-eye -eye conversation. There's a mutual peer-to-peer -peer respect you can have in having that discussion. So that happening quickly is something that people usually don't do. Uh, I would say, um, there's a tendency to talk about products, um, and investors don't really invest in products, they invest in companies. So um, you want to, uh, although you want to get across obviously what the problem and uh, the solution, sorry, that your product is bringing to a, a, a problem that's out there, there's a load of things you need to put yourself in the mindset of an investor, and the investor's generally investing because they need to make a return, normally for somebody else. Um, and for that to happen, they have to be super confident in the, the overall opportunity that the investment represents, not just how cool your product is. So if you come from an engineering background or you have a background that is very product orientated, it can easily end up as a sort of three minute explanation of why your product is better than somebody else's product. And that is probably a road or a cul-de-sac that you'll end up um, going down when the investor goes, oh, I don't really understand what the market opportunity is here, or or how how we make money. So I would I would say uh, number one thing for me is to remember no one apart from Shark Tank or Dragon Den or whatever, no one gets money after a three minute pitch. The whole point of it really is to create a load of questions in the mind of the of the VC or or, or the investor that he's desperate to ask you, so that you can start a dialogue and meet the team and, and begin to court each other. Um, so try and be a bit inspiring and, and try and keep it high level enough that someone that doesn't have the domain understanding of your particular niche can get without getting too deep into the product details, is my tip. I think one thing I could say to the especially early stage company founders is they need to be a bit more self-aware. When, when I was working professionally as an investor, I was based in the US and then also London. So it's kind of the epicenter of the investment world. So not only investors, but our startups are a little bit more sophisticated in a way that they know what investors want. Or sometimes it's not good, but they know what investors want to hear. So the meeting is very efficient. I walk in, they prepared uh, very well prepared pitches, very concise, and I move over and we, we get all about meeting uh, on time. 
here people are a little bit more naive from my experience, which is also in, in a way nice, but at the same time, you should not mix up that investor savvy versus being naive in business. So I think as an investor, we want to know that you are aware, self-aware to what you're doing. You know your competitor, you did your research, which is, you cannot say, skip that, say, okay, I'm focused on my product. If you don't know your competitor, if you don't know what investors are looking for, if you don't know what's going to the next round and what you need to achieve, you're just naive and then it's not, the business is not gonna go anywhere. So, yeah, um, that's my one thing. I will monopolize the mic because I want to ask a few questions <laughs> with the answers. So talking about the uh, experience of working in other locations again uh, and about entrepreneurship uh, in Singapore, what do you think is the difference between, hey, okay, you are from the US originally, used to work in Australia, Rafael used to work also in London, <coughs> if you're in Singapore, so you have like, different markets to compare with. Um, what's your impression? What kind of, again, talking about the level of entrepreneurs, you mentioned it already, but uh, what about your experience from the um, I would say there's like a big array of, uh, it, it normally comes down to what, what experience the founder has had in the mm -hmm. past, and depending on the sector, then, you know, naturally there's I guess a lot more mature or slightly more mature uh, businesses in Europe and, and US, etc. Whereas if you look uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, then there's predominantly a lot of consumer brands and things which are coming through, but there's not so many of the B2B type SaaS type platforms and things you would see in the US, Europe, etc. Why do you think it's so? The difference in the type of business? Just the market dynamics, really, and the, the, uh, the, the reality of the region. Um, you know, if you, the exciting thing about here is this is the place to be. In, in, in terms of Southeast Asia, we all know what's going to happen with um, the expected changes in the middle classes here. They're, they're mobile first. Um, everyone's kind of mobile first, I guess, in, 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 in some respects. I mean, Singapore, Hong Kong, these are very different, but if you look at the, the volume opportunity of people, you're going to see 60% of, of the world's middle classes in this region of the world, which is super exciting. And there's heaps of people that have never been banked that can suddenly have access to life-changing things. And if you look at Vietnam as a market, it's incredible. 40 million people lifted out of poverty. The things that they've done to increase just the general um, like competitiveness and, 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 and bring in investment, bring in um, uh, you know, uh, talent and, and money. But, but also nurture through education their own market and, and, and really develop is extremely inspiring. And you've got huge markets like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and all these things. So to an investor, it's extremely exciting, but it's also quite complex because you've got lots of different cultures, a bit like Europe, I guess, whereas US and China are big enough to be their own markets in their own right. Um, so I think it's very cool for people who are from a different place, you know, if you took a um, Ventures One, Tony, who's the CEO here for us, he went online to get car insurance and there wasn't any direct car insurance, so he thought he'd made a mistake, but then he realised he really had to make it, and so he applied for the MA, uh, license with MAS, it was super hard because he was the first, and then he did the same in Hong Kong, he did the same in Thailand, and then about three years ago, uh, years ago he got bought by a Big European insurer who wanted access to that market but didn't want to have to make it themselves. So in terms of exit opportunities, you could take business models that are working in other markets and providing you can localize them, you know, you can pretty much almost guarantee that you'll, you, you could have something very attractive uh, as an exit opportunity. So that, that in itself makes it a very cool place to be bringing different uh, business models and concepts into. Would you agree with the concept that the games, if you want to address it, it doesn't mean that you have, you all have to answer the same question, just if you have something to add. Would you say that um, the, the, the main concept is that Asia is good to implement businesses which, or ideas which were already implemented in Europe just to replicate them here to scale them in Asia? Would um, you agree with that, talking about the It never really yes. works like that. Yeah. Um, it has to, there has to be 
a good fit with the consumer. So, um, you know, if you look at the timing of that as an example, FWD have now come in and they're pretty much buying the market. So if Tony hadn't got out three years ago, then who knows, you know. So when you look at um, all the things you have to be, and uh, you also need to have timing as like one of the biggest things that you're thinking about, is now the right time for the service that you're looking for or the solution that you have? Or, you know, because being too early is almost worse than being uh, too late, you know, people think that it's an advantage to be first, but it's, it's normally not um, because you've got to burn a load of cash, you're going to have to convince the market, educate the market that this is the way to go. And if you take Direct Asia as an example, they had a lot of resistance, obviously, because it's a broker, um, broker based market. Here. So, no, it's not kind of like a cut and paste, but if you can identify or if you see things, then you're going to naturally want to apply it um, where you are. And if you can make it work, then good deal. Thank you. I'll, just, I'll add to the uh, first question. Um, one of the great parts about, so, I, so for some background, I worked in the US for a few different businesses, tech businesses. Uh, one of them you may have heard of LinkedIn, and then I worked in Europe uh, and Australia and New Zealand for LinkedIn, Twitter, and then Dropbox, and I so, uh, subsequently consulted for a lot of large businesses and a lot of small businesses, small startups. One of the things I found in moving to different markets is that it's pretty obvious to most people that both investor cash as well as um, scaling of ideas is usually in the follow the sun model where you know, you've got a lot of North American businesses will scale up a lot of similar types of businesses will scale up in Europe, and a lot of similar types of businesses will scale up in, in Asia as well. Um, the follow up model, how it applies here, is that um, it's really, really early stage for venture capital and angel capital, especially seed and angel capital, to be coming into the region and deploying it into a significant amount of businesses. Um, the reason for that is just a natural evolution of more businesses, more entrepreneurs, more good ideas, etc. Uh, the challenge is that it is a relatively talent-starved region for when you start these businesses. So when you start these businesses, you've got these great ideas that work somewhere else, but going to find access to the same level of talent as well as quantity of talent uh, to execute is really challenging in, in this particular region because there are less people that have been there and done that. What that also means, it translates to um, in entrepreneurs in the investor community as well. So there are less entrepreneurs that have started a business, been there, done that, exited, been through all the shit that they need to go through to solve all the problems over a three, four, five, six, ten year period and then exited. That's challenging for investors because they are used to seeing other entrepreneurs or a lot of entrepreneurs in more mature markets that have been there and done that, at, at least a, a larger uh, number of them as a percentage of the pitches that they see. So what that means for investors in this region is they need to get used to a couple of things. One, um, the challenges of not having zero entrepreneurs or, or, or non-first time entrepreneurs uh, pitching, which is, that, that's probably why a lot more capital is being deployed in this region because there's a lot of opportunity for that as well, a lot more energy. Number two, it means that um, the talent um, in a lot of these different countries and specifically in Singapore, there's a ton of opportunity and a lot of businesses, but they're all fighting for the same type of talent to execute a lot of these ideas. And then um, the third is that um, because there's been less businesses that have been there and done that, and less talent that have been there and done that, oftentimes, to Ross's point, is you need to educate the market on something, on a product or a service that may be natural or already in the mainstream in a different part of the world that education can be expensive. So because, because I've talked to Roth about this before, but when you look at the scale of, there's obviously everyone's heard this word disruption, which I think is a nonsensical term that you can use as much as it is, but there's a spectrum, I believe, of disruption of, on one side, you've got people don't even know they have a problem that you are presenting a solution for, and they don't know the solution exists. On the other end of that spectrum, you've got people know they have a problem, they know the solution exists, and there's quite a few of those solutions, so it actually becomes a pricing or a features game for a lot of those different products. 
everywhere in between, you're kind of moving this way uh, on the spectrum and trying to get as far towards this end of the spectrum as possible so that you don't need to educate the market that they have the problem or that your solution exists. When you do have to educate the, the market, it means it's a pretty expensive marketing challenge because um, you need to play thought leader as well as transactor and, uh, and try to transact for um, uh, at scale. So I think that's a beautiful part about uh, about investing in Southeast Asia specifically and, and in Singapore. There's so much opportunity and there's a massive vacuum and gap of, of uh, investment for the amount of businesses uh, that are out there, which is great. But it means that there's challenges with scaling and there's challenges with talent to, to look for all these businesses to look at the same talent pool. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brandon. So again, we're a bit running out of time, and before the coming uh, presentation, what I would like to ask you, what do you think are the most essential elements of the presentation uh, when you hear the project speaking to you? What is the definitely something they need to cover? Maybe the sequence or something, what would you recommend? I usually make my judgment in the first slide mostly. So, so I'm just saying you know your investors. Typically, investors see, in my case, um, I probably see 10 to 20 companies per week. Uh, many, I, I tend to follow up with many of them as long as there's one or two things that's interesting. But then um, my attention span is limited, and so it's probably many investors. Uh, so you you should expect that the investor, even if you meet them for an hour, it's probably one or two things, or maybe two or three things that in investor remembers. So make sure when you walk into the meeting or go to the pitch, you know exactly what are the minimum two or three things that you want to convey and then the rest can be forgotten. Or they ask questions and they remember better the questions than what's being told. Mm -hmm. But again, what are the most uh, essential elements which you want to hear from them? Because again, as we just clarified, you make judgment, uh, judgment after the first slide and you are not reading or you don't remember what was in the project, that's fine. I, I actually might not be listening much of the content, but I do, I am observing that person. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not particular things that I try to pick up, but uh, just by because I, we, I've seen so many pitches and presentations, so it does not take long time to see that if the person knows a subject very well and if the person is passionate and very dedicated, and it just kind of, kind of transcends. Mm -hmm. So of course it's a it's, it's a given that you prepare your presentation in a concise manner. And an understandable plan. But in a way, after all the preparation, you just transcend everything in the first couple of maybe seconds. Um, in like, finding investors a bit like getting married is often said, um, and it is true. You can't, it's very hard to invest in someone you don't like. Um, or and like, likewise, if you're an entrepreneur, the last thing you want is someone investing in you that you're not gonna gel with and bond with. So I wouldn't worry too much about trying to please everyone. I think what Shoku was saying is great, which is it's kind of a, you know, you can't expect people to remember everything. So if you know like the rule of three, what are the three things, because that's about the limit, that this person is gonna take away from the pitch, the pitch is fairly short anyway. Um, if you can start making your pitch based around those three killer things, then you're in control of, of like the general theme or the, or the thing that you're trying to get across. So energy is like an important thing. How you come across is really the one thing that the, that the investor will take away. Um, and considering you don't want to get married to somebody that you don't like, it's just about trying to gel with, you know, be yourself, get your message across as best you can, and, and, and see where it goes. And by, by not caring so much, you'll be a bit more relaxed. Um, because don't forget, VCs have to do this themselves. 
Most VCs are out dating LPs the whole time trying to raise capital. They have exactly the same like slide decks, but they've all got a thesis, which is all unique. And you know, they're gonna make more money than the next VC, all this kind of stuff. So they're everyone's salespeople. Everyone's salespeople and salespeople are, are suckers to be sold to. So <laughs> so just like hook them in. I always say like the pitch is basically like a trailer to a movie. Um, if you've ever seen a really crap movie, uh, but a really great trailer, I've got a friend John in the UK, what he does is make trailers and, tease, and basically tease us into thinking it's going to be a good movie when it's not. So <laughs> just win us over a little bit and then we'll want to talk about things and if we like you enough we'll probably find out ways that we can work out how to fix some of the problems. Um, and, and away we go. That's it. So it's all about charm after all. Yeah, I mean, just be, be yourself though. I think you can't, you can't deliberately charm someone, you know, it's, mm -hmm. otherwise you come across smarmy. Just um, if, you, if you really love your project, you're gonna, it's gonna come across. Mm -hmm. And that's what investors buy into. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, so I'll say the three core elements of every pitch that I'm looking at, uh, whether it's a whether it's pitched to me as an investor or pitched to me as a consultant are three main things. People, product, and market. That's pretty simple, but I compartmentalize everything going on in the pitch into those three things. Regardless of how many slides you have, really call it that. That's what I'm compartmentalizing. So if you have three, you know, three slides and that was it, that's fine for me. Um, the three X factors that I look for um, are um, humor, so a sense of humor. I don't think it's important to be funny in the pitch. I think that it's important that that person has a sense of humor. Um, I'll probably crack a joke at three. Just a little, little check to Ross's point about not marrying anyone you don't like. He likes his wife, Sam, and I like her too, and I think he did a good job, and I think uh, that's what he's looking at. Uh, but it'll trip him up. We'll send the right. to my advice. <laughs> that's what Ross for. And start someone somebody like I agree, I think humor is a massive part of it. And if I can't get along with somebody and joke around, you know, I want to have some fun while we're kicking ass and, and taking names as well. Uh, the second is a level of nerdiness. Like how how much of a nerd is this person about this topic? I love talking to super nerds about the topic, you know, the problem they're trying to solve. Uh, it's just really attractive and like super sexy from an investor perspective because they live it, they breathe it, it's what they care about. Regardless of you know if someone likes it or not, like they they love it about the topic. And then the third one's a sense of calm. Um, so there's a uh, there's a sense of um, you know I think so I described it uh, as the grass is greener. Oh, sorry, the grass is green. That is so the grass is green is um, whether you believe it or anyone else believes it. Um, this business is going to work. Sure as the grass is green, yep. this is going to work. And I'm going to go solve this problem and execute this business, whether you like it or anyone else likes it, I'm going to solve this problem. It's part of my life's mission. That we'll and so um, a sense of calm comes with that, that like, regardless of what anyone else buys what I'm doing in here, you know, sure as the grass is green, I'm really calm, but I'm just gonna go solve this problem. Mm -hmm. That's probably three next factors. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask if we have any questions to our panelists. I can go on with the conversation, but if you want to ask him something while there's the right one. No? No initiative? Okay. Um, so one of the things, once again, which I keep hearing at, at all the conferences where VCs are sharing what they invest into, what are the criteria and all of that, they, of course, they all think about numbers, but the common thing which I hear all the time, they invest into the personality. At the same time, talking to different startups, what we see when they present their project or whatever the concept is that they are not sure how much money they will raise, how they should present it, how they should structure their uh, business. Um, sorry, like what's what's the business model? Um, and there is kind of lack of this. Can I do it or not? So what I hear from the funds very often is that they're really investing to somebody who's passionate about that specific topic because it doesn't matter uh, if they will make mistakes on the way or not, but if they're really passionate about that specific industry or that specific issue, they will make it happen. And then funds, as you mentioned during uh, your previous responses, 
they actually see this passion and if they like the person, they're happy to jump on board and invest and also help you to develop your business. Uh, what are your comments on that? Why, why do you help, I mean, if you invest into the project, what, what's the thing apart from passion and do they, can they crack a job or something? But also, why are you willing to help them? And what you can help them? For me, it's them? like, the, if the person is super passionate about the thing and they know what they're talking about and they're able to communicate that enough to, to us both agree that there is an opportunity, then really it's a case of understanding where are the gaps. Like what have they got really nailed and what are the bits that they need help with and then have we in our toolkit or in you know, what we can offer, does it fit with that? If it doesn't, uh, it's not going to be like lightning bolts going off, but if, if you can say, well actually hold on, we've got this and that really works with what you're doing, then it's going to naturally just go somewhere. So I think it, that's why you can't kind of second guess the investor. If the investor can say they're into a certain sector, but then you don't know who their LPs are, you don't know who, you know, beyond what you read on their LinkedIn, what their background is and things like that. So um, it is like matchmaking, yeah. Um, just to clarify, I, I don't invest in passion. I don't believe that passion would make a great business. Uh, it definitely comes from my experience of running a startup myself. And, uh, maybe against like Mario said, uh, first, when you're starting out, it's, it looks it's fantastic, but then very quickly the reality kicks in and then passion will be blown away. But, so, and also I don't like the, the entrepreneur who's, who has fallen in love with his idea or her idea. So, um, passion for me, uh, if you're not into it or dedicated to it, then there's no point doing it. But then I don't mix that with a passion. Um, and then what was the question? <laughs> no, it was normally if you see this passion because that's the common thing which I keep hearing at the conferences from all the VCs. So they will talk about the numbers, elements, and everything. But then yeah, yeah. Is that um, yeah. So don't mix up that investors do calculations on the back. Yeah. So whatever you are a nice person or you are charming, um, in the end, if that's the business you are trying to do is attractive. So I fall in love with a business model or nice business because there are certain attractive businesses that you should go after. Then the charming, the charm adds in because if you're not charming, you will not be able to attract your team and you will not be able to build your team. And you cannot be a good salesperson if you're not attractive as a person. So that would add in. But me personally, I, I do look at business and then if business is not interesting, then the rest it is, matter, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, two quick things to it. One is, um, I think about, uh, can we make a lot of money together? Like, you're good, you're trying to do this because you're passionate about solving problem, but you want to make some cash. Investors, you want to make cash and we're responsible to make that cash for our LPs and our our, our investors and they invest in funds or our own cash ranges. Um, can we make a lot of cash together? Number one, that's, I mean, let's do this together. Let's go make some money together. <laughs> uh, number two, um, uh, number two is, um, actually I forgot because I was listening to what you said. Let's see here. Um, yeah, probably. that's it. <laughs> number one, number one, number two, number one. <laughs> we have, yeah, we have a question, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. I'm related to that. If you can, yeah, if you can also please introduce yourself. When, when uh, sure, yeah. sure. David, David McGrath. So uh, yeah, so we're uh, we're co-founders, Adrian and I, on the mm -hmm. uh, marketing innovation platform. Um, so the question is, is uh, in terms of valuation, you know, there's multiple valuation methods for startups. Uh, which one do each one of you, you know? Utilize, it's your favorite, this is how I value the company. Uh, lots of different methods, but which one is your personal go-to? Is this how I value the company? Why? Yeah, that's a good question. 
Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Rob to start, but I remember my second thing very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people, I think that uh, people are innately um, two things: one, they want to help, and two, selfish. Uh, so when they hear a pitch and it's really good, they first think, um, "How can I help?" First thing is access to capital. The second thing is, "How can I help this business grow?" And then people are also innately selfish, as in. Um, you know, I want to be a part of this story because I think it's going somewhere, yeah. and I want to help, but I also um, want you and I to look good together. And so I think I think investors think in both of those lenses. Yeah. Oh, okay. Valuation models. What are the yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, it's kind of boring. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, it's important. Um, yeah, it's so, how much is this mug worth? <laughs> Exactly, you buy me selling. Um, it's an old meme, but it's true, right? And um, I think if you're early in the journey, I mean, as soon as you get traction and you've got customers and things, it gets easier because you've got more metrics. But if you're very early in the journey, really you're looking for someone who believes in what you're doing. And you need to work out how much cash you need in order to be able for the business to wash its own face so that you're not gonna run out of money because the more time you spend fundraising, the less time you spend focused on on the customer. So it doesn't really matter what my favorite is <laughs> because depending on the investor, you will have a conversation with that investor and they and, and really what this is all about is testing each other's assumptions about, you know. So after the pitch, once we've got excited about your business, then we have a quick chat and you sort of we want to see a business plan, right? We want to see an Excel. And so we look at the Excel, the purpose of that is really to test the assumptions behind how your revenue line builds, how your cost burn builds. And there's really, you know, that's make or break because everybody will say this is a super conservative uh, assumptions and it will kind of still be a hockey stick, right? Jacob just kind of shooting up like, um, so your concept of conservative, it might be very different from the other person's experience of risk and uh, in growing startups. So at Ventures One, we have done a lot of convertible debt. So initial equity, if you like, so that uh, everyone's aligned and, and then we'll just keep dripping money in because we believe in what you're doing and it's a way of delaying evaluation. Um, there's good and bad to that though. So um, basically, you could end up with more equity in something which sounds attractive, but it's more equity in something that's performing badly. And then you have an entrepreneur, you know, who hasn't reached his business plan, who then is feeling, you know, dejected because there's more dilution or whatever. So there's no, um, everyone will have different ways of doing it. You just have to be realistic that without money, that the game doesn't start. So if you can hustle and you can do enough to get a bit of traction with your friends, family, angel, or whatever, then you're on, you know, you're set maybe to be able to be a bit more in control of that valuation discussion. But typically whatever you're raising, it's gonna be sort of like, I don't know, 10 to 30% that the investor probably is expecting for that raise, depending on things. I mean, that's just kind of how it falls a lot of the time. Um, for valuation, um, my favorite is a stage-based valuation. So if you're uh, for early stage, so if you're just uh, idea-based, your valuation should work, uh, fall within a certain range. If your product is already built and then MVP is there, then it should be certain range. And if you're generating revenue, um, it also adds up to the valuation. And there's also geographical differences. So if I look at the same stage of startup in, for example, Indonesia or Vietnam or Cambodia, they, they are much cheaper compared to Singapore. So I'm actually seeing some trend that uh, some Cambodian companies or you know, Indonesian companies coming to incorporate Singapore, uh, not only because it's easier to attract investors, but also valuation here is a lot higher. Uh, but having said that, Silicon Valley is much better. But I think that that uh, for the same stage, um, what I would expect to be two, three million valuation company in Silicon Valley 
in a straight face they're asking for 10 million. So <laughs> that's the kind of difference we see. Uh, but I think that could also be explained that uh, if you're based in the US, it's a one big single market that you can tap on. So uh, also what's the backbone of the market uh, as to the valuation metrics? The last question, just to finish our panel, yes, um, is when you are giving the feedback to the entrepreneurs who present their project to you, what is the absolute no-go from their side when they hear your reaction to their pitch? What shouldn't they do? Yeah, exactly. Oh, be defensive. Like, you know, it, oftentimes investors just, they, they want to help, and so they're giving feedback I, I, I give feedback directly between the eyes. Like I am between the eyes, I give it straight. But but that's right. But um, but that doesn't mean that you're, someone's not trying to. Anyways, the point is that oftentimes investors are just trying to help. So there's not really a point in getting defensive because either one that's going to say that you probably don't want to work with this person because they're going to get defensive on any either contradictory or going with your ideas. Um, no matter what, you're working together. They could get defensive over time, which is not a good formula or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, I think that even on the opposite end of the spectrum, agreeing that there are downsides to to your plan, um, call, even before you give feedback, calling out the risks and the downside to like why can this fall apart. I would call that a, a, in sales. You can handle objections before they happen. So handle the objections before they happen, such that you're saying the downside of the risk of investing in their business or why the business could fail before they say it. Um, but if they give you reasons why why it could fail, um, if you're contradicting what they're saying, it doesn't mean you're being defensive. Just don't have a tone like you're being defensive. Come at it like we're trying to solve this problem together because that's why everyone's here because we're all interested in hearing what everyone has to say. I totally agree about the uh, no-no is uh, being defensive. Um, that usually when there's a difficult question that you might not have prepared answer, that's the best moment for us to find out that how this person is going to behave in a real business situation. So, yeah, being defensive is uh, probably the last thing you want to do. Just I'm more positive. Uh, it's a journey, basically, is, and I think a lot of the times, VC, you can't control what they've just gone through, right? You don't know the person you're talking to, whether they've had an argument, whether they've got real serious pressures. They they don't have much time, and they're probably trying to put you in a box, like, in terms of, what is this thing that you're presenting to me? So they'll probably say it's, you know, maybe some stuff that could get you back up. So, yeah, defensive one is, is a big one. Uh, but remembering that like, it's a connected world and uh, I'm talking to people I was talking with a year ago and now actually some things have changed, their team's improved, they've got a bit more fit and suddenly something that wasn't you know, probably investable a year ago is looking like, hold on, this, suddenly they've, they've got something here. <laughs> and so just remember that, don't burn bridges, no point, like, you, you can show this guy by um, you know, talking to other people and, and improving on each time you pitch, improving on, 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 your, on your fit with your customer. And if, if you're consistent, if you hustle and you're consistent, the, then investors are gonna like, oh wow, this person's got what it takes. And they're probably gonna wanna introduce you to other people, even if, they, if you don't fit into their kind of narrow um, investment category. So don't burn bridges, look at it as an opportunity, look at it as a journey and see if you can um, build a relationship over time and, and, and you never know where it would go. Yeah, sorry, one thing. Uh, investors talk, so you guys have heard the, uh, maybe the statistic that if you have a good experience with something, you tell a fraction of a person, you, you had a bad experience, you tell seven people. Um, investors talk, so if they have a bad experience and you are defensive and you're giving feedback or um, sorry, they're they're giving feedback and you can react in a poor way. Like the investors will talk to like, oh, this guy's like, this girl's a pain and this guy's a pain. Like don't get in that scenario where investors are talking in a negative way. Uh, it's a pretty small, it's a really small community. Yeah. Yeah. Most important, don't end on the Jesus pose. <laughs>
don't know what's going on with Entrepreneur First, I went to the cohort, everyone like finished the three minute pitch. <laughs> I think we're done with the panel. You want to ask yeah, a I question? Sure. Sure. It's not, um, Can you please introduce yourself? My name is Louis. I'm a private investor. I raise capital for firms as well. Uh, I'm starting a new project in crypto and blockchain. I came along because I'm trying to learn the space here as a uh, I've invested a million bucks of my own money in companies as a learner from a guy who worked in markets, who bought and sold bonds and currencies and stuff. And I waded into a space I had no idea about. Zero. <laughs> a couple of things that I would say. Don't invest with anybody with any family or familial relationship that you have whatsoever. Ever. <laughs> I mean ever. No ever. experience. This this is that's a quarter of a million dollars right there straight away. Number one. Number two, the power of three you guys were talking about. Cartoons sell. We got to know each other, our esteemed anchor person on the anchor lady on the, uh, on the panel. We got to know each other in a half an hour session where I tried to show her my cartoon of the world of crypto and blockchain. Pretty much it looked like this yes, one on the background. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Like that's, that's our meaning. Yeah, so, so cartoons, people are dumb. Okay? They have lots of money. Thank and, you. <laughs> and, and if you want to take the money off, you have to make it uh, your idea is translatable. You have to make people understand what you're selling them. So make it in three cartoons. You know, Big Bird, The Muppets, I don't care what you <laughs> use. But you said be humorous. Yeah. Well, at least make something that people, yeah. you know, because they're bored of shit in this all day long, sit, sitting 20 meetings a week, and you're bored out of your tree, seeing people come with the same old body. Like that. <laughs> Another thing that I see, a great idea is not a business, is not a guaranteed business win. Okay? I invested enough money in a company that I thought would create a great solution for for the terrorism threat analysis game. And given how many people are being killed in Europe on a on a daily basis from terrorism threat, big data, I thought we had great idea. The guy I invested in was a family friend, he was a drunk, he was depressed, <laughs> and he had no fucking idea whatsoever about how to run a business. So when you have somebody who has a good idea, one good idea doesn't necessarily mean they're going to translate that into a profitable invention. If they have a partner who understands business, who gets that ship, who understands how to translate that really good idea, that they have a good efficient partnership, to me, that was the lesson that I learned. A hard earned lesson is that we eventually overthrew the CEO, kicked him out of the company, and hired a really good C a COO who had run businesses before. But that cost us the investor group five million bucks to find that, that, that equation out. And these are seasoned venture capital people as well. So those are just some small observations that I would make. And the reason I'm passing them off, because it hurt. Okay, and the point that you make is seven to whatever it is. I guarantee you that CEO, if I have anything whatsoever to do with it, he'll never get an invite to any of our family events. <laughs> and I guarantee you, if I can do anything about it, he'll never get a job in Europe ever again, given how he was irresponsible with our money. So those are just some observations for somebody who loved, who spent a lot of money to find out the hard thing. I think we have a candidate for the next panel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I'm an entrepreneur res in residence at Kinsia. I see yeah. a couple of other EIRs also in here. Yes. Uh, and for the last two years, I've been very active in the startup space. I've probably seen close to 500 pitches. Uh, some really, really good, some really, really bad. So I'll share with you a couple of things, right? I'm assuming most people here are early stage startup guys. And is there anybody who already has traction? No, or mostly people thinking, right, entrepreneurs? So that, that's a term I've got. If you're a entrepreneur, right, uh, don't worry, it's actually a big trend. I left uh, a great job at Cisco, I ran all the demo facilities across the region, and I saw a lot of digital disruption happening. So I decided I'm going to step out, and I'm going to be doing the disruption. So I've invested in around five startups, I'm creating my own startup, I mean, Shoko saw my presentation and uh, funded here. So I've done my own share of pitches, I've helped people do their own pitches. What I want to perhaps share with you is three or four things, right, which I would recommend if you are 
a entrepreneur and if you're thinking of an idea, right? First thing first, do not raise money from professional investors until if you have a single dollar revenue. Because if you go to try to raise money from an investor, you don't have any traction, they are not going to give you any money. So this is a bit contrary to what you said, right? I would focus on the three Fs. The friends, the families, and the, and the fools. Right? This is a critical one. Your grandma will give you money because she likes you. Not because she likes your idea, but she likes you. Your friends will give you money because they believe in you. And fools, they really, really love your idea. But remember, for every unique idea you have at this point of time, 100 other people are having the same idea. 90 people will not do anything about it. Out of the 10 people who are going to do something about it, 9 will give up in 3 months. You are the 10th. I'm sorry, we need yeah, to exactly. talk about the Just a quick one, storytelling. Focus on storytelling because that <coughs> resonates. Something called TED, uh, talk like TED, look at that particular book. Um, no two pitches should be the same. So focus on who your investor is and build your story accordingly. Happy to share more if we have any time at the end, but I just wanted to share because I spend a lot of time with early stage investors. So I want to make sure that uh, if you are thinking of setting up your own business, you will get a ton of advice. But at the end of the day, you need to focus on what's for you. Okay, thank you. Let's give it to the young Guys, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful <coughs> answers and sharing your experience. And I know it's tough to have like 20 projects per week and you know doing some homework before you get ready to listen to that. And then at the end, you want to have really fun experience, as you said. And nobody from the investors, not only those who are here at the panel, but overall, they, they wouldn't meet you if they would like to um, to give you like negative feedback or something or to turn down your business idea. So if they do it, if they give this feedback to you, then you need to really consider it, whether you were not clear in your presentation or it really not, not working. Um, so thank you very much for this hard work and thank you for the participation of the panel.